Welcome to HeroQuest fans. Okay, this is a little bit of an unscheduled video. Well, I knew it was coming. My copy of uh, Against the Ogre Horde has finally arrived. It arrived much earlier today, but I was working the night shift, so this is as soon as I could pick it up. And I know I'm the last person to review it, but whatever. Here it is. So ordered it from Amazon.com US. This is not a sponsored video, but I will shout out to Carl Casey at White Bat Audio for the music. I'm getting pumped up here. Anyway, I'm just going to do a little unboxing. We'll start out with the non-spoilers, then we'll get into spoilers. So, of course, this is the box. Shrink-wrapped. Everybody's seen this. So you can see this stuff. And actually, I really want to shout out uh, Ace Bauer. He did what Dead Gamer did for me with the, uh, the Mythic tier. Uh, Ace Bauer, he spoiled all this for me and for our HeroQuest fans Discord. So thanks. Uh, big shout out to him. Gave us a really good idea of what to expect and definitely knew this was uh, something that I wanted to buy. So I'll just further show you what's in this box. Um, and then, you know, you can go to your favorite uh, YouTuber, check them out, see uh, their unboxing. I'm sure Amalgamash at AshQuest. Always Bored, Never Boring, Dungeon Master, um, LaGuardia de Marcar, Jordan Sorcery, Bardic Broadcasts, um, all your friends, all your favorite uh, streamers, L Viler, developviler.com. Everybody's going to cover it in, huh, interesting. Okay, first thing I see right away is this box is smooth. It's shiny. Um, through the course of these Hero Quest expansions, starting with um, the Frozen Horror, each one they got more and more texture on the box, more and more like linen finish, until like I think it reached its peak with um, Rise of the Dread Moon. It was just like it was almost felt like a playing card, and it would slide off really easy. Whereas this one, it just plain old like shiny cardboard. Nobody cares, but I'm just noticing it. So little things that you don't get just looking at a video. So there's the inside of the box. Everybody's seen this. This is the new tile. So this is the arena. Yeah, this definitely has some texture on it. It's linen. But it's a much smoother finish than the other uh, the other expansions. I mean, it doesn't feel quite as textured, if that makes sense. So if you get really close, you can see that linen finish. So, yeah, so we've got the arena. This is a new thing that did not exist in the 1990 version of Against the Ogre Horde. And you've got these tiles, which we now know what they mean. This is the potion tile. If you're adjacent to it or land on it, you can pick it up when you're in this arena mode. The first three quests are the arena. I think everybody knows that now. And you can also play it independently. Just like, you don't even have to be playing a quest. Just like, ah, let's just have a quick skirmish. So they've made Hero Quest into a skirmish game. This is like two games in one. There's a skirmish battle between two teams, or you can do, uh, you know, the seven quests plus the three tournaments. Okay. So then you've also got these other. These are bonuses. So two extra white shields, two extra black shields, two extra skulls, one white shield, one black shield, one skull. So you can swap out your role for one of those according to the rules we've looked at. And these, a lot of people have speculated and said, oh, you're looting bodies, you're murder hobos. Does that look like a dead body to you? To me, that looks like a skeleton wearing armor. And he's got a sword. I was thinking he had a pry bar in his hand. Is this meant to be taken literally? Like there's really a skeleton laying there in that exact pose and you flip it over and oh, it's that. I was thinking, oh, it's a helpful little skeleton, and he's like showing you, hey, lift this tile up and you'll find, but it's very symbolic, so I think it's just to show you, hey, we don't know what this really is, you flip it over and that's what it is. So you've got this arena, it looks like it's kind of cleaned out, well, there's some like debris laying there from the battle, but this is totally new, this did not exist before this expansion, and this is the, uh, the arena, it's like a gladiator type combat area got various weapons lying around cut off horns body parts broken smashed armor and things like that it looks pretty cool 
lots of people have come up with the idea of having an arena in Hero Quest, but it'd be interesting to see uh, Avalon Hill's official take on it. And of course, they include this with everything. This is the little flyer to get the companion app. I noticed the companion app's only supported through June 14th of 2025, so that's interesting to me. What's going to happen after that? So anyway, there you go. Uh, it's free. There's no ads. Okay, here's the, the first of the classic tiles. So originally these two, well here, we don't have to guess. I'll show you. I have the original against the Ogre Horde. I got this from a cool guy in Board Game Geek. This is the original compared to the remake version. See there? So you can see the squares are just a little bit bigger the new version. And you flip it over and look at that. So originally it was the same tile. So they split it up for a reason so that they could give you more area. And once again, you've got the the linen finish, whereas in the original, it's just a smooth finish. Okay, so there we've started the un, uh, the punching, punching out. But if we flip these over, what do we see? So on the back of the eye mosaic room tile, we've got this. So this is a new image. Kind of looks like, okay, this is where this fighting team starts out in the tournament. Could also be like you've cleaned out this area. It's empty. This area is on the back of the carpet or the rug but yeah you see originally it was much smaller and it was the same one okay so they got these falling block tiles or blocked squares that's just standard hero quest stuff nothing new there but what's on the other side oh look something different these are activation tiles we wondered what these were these hourglasses so you're supposed to put these next to um, a figure when you're doing the arena or tournament battle mode, the skirmish mode in Hero Quest, to show, okay, this miniature is activated. So one team starts first. I forget if it's the defenders or the attackers. And then you uh, lay a tile down. So, okay, you get to move one of your guys. I get to move one of my guys. Your guys, my guys, etc., etc. It could be heroes versus monsters or monsters versus monsters. If somebody gets killed, you drop this to show that they dropped their equipment there. I guess that means someone could claim it in theory so yeah that's that all right we're doing carl casey at white bat audio getting that music going so yeah we flip it over so these are the activation tiles and the death but how come there's only one of them i don't know okay so these are the pits of darkness these are really really deep pits they have special rules for them I don't remember them offhand, uh, but I do know that if you fall into one of these pits, you take more damage based on the stronger the armor you've got. So if it's, in this one they said if it's uh, no armor or non-metal armor, so that'd be bracers, you take one body point of damage, and if it gets metal armor, so like chainmail or whatever, I don't know if it includes shields, uh, you take two, and then if it's plate mail, or I suppose Born's armor, you take three. But you got to roll a die to see if you actually take the damage. Secret doors, standard, and again on the other side, it's these. So I like it when they, they just put standard tiles on the other side rather than just the same image. It's kind of silly. But yeah, you notice every expansion they do this. They put different combinations so that you're putting you're sorting them all out at the end of putting them back in the box. You can kind of tell what goes with what. Oops. So then we've got this tile. This is the chasm. Now, people were scared of this because... There is, and you'll see, there is a dread spell that allows the bad guys to take control of the good guys, and he could just march him right into the abyss, and he'd die. Fall in there and die. So unless you've got the elf flashback spell, uh, he's gone for good. I guess you could use the elixir of life and teleport him back to back to where you go. But there's no artifacts in this, in this, this uh, quest book. So now you could be starting from scratch with brand new heroes. And that's tough luck, or maybe you've saved up gear from some other expansion. You've played the game system first, and then you're playing these in order. You might have stuff stored up. Okay, so this, uh, this is the, I don't know, the death room, the debris room, whatever you want to call it. Let's see what it looked like in the original version from 1990. Because this is a 2024 release, just came out yesterday. So this is what the original looked like. This is not a printout, although I have printed these out. This is what the original looked like. So it's a little darker, grittier, less 
comic book esque, but clearly inspired. That is a big sword. It's huge. Flip it over. There we go. Because the new board, of course, uses the one inch squares versus the 22 millimeter squares. There's a little crease there that got bent back in the day. But there you go. That's a comparison. So as we continue our unboxing, we'll toss these aside. There's the big outdoor area. It's got squares, but it kind of doesn't even matter. It's like you just enter. Let's see, we're, there's supposed to be a cave. Is that considered the cave that you enter? You enter in, and then you come back out again. So it's just kind of on the edge of the board. It's just kind of hanging off the edge. Uh, people were pointing out, I think it might have been Verg that said it. It's like, well, you could put some cardboard underneath it or something. Hey, they gave you a piece of cardboard just to kind of support it so it's not like hanging off the edge of the table. It's going to fall off or, or get bent or something when you've got pieces like balancing on it. Because, you know, these things, these bigger tiles can get bent. Oh, yeah. Look at the thickness. Let's compare. So you can see this one got a little warped. How thick is it compared to the new one? Okay, we'll just pop that one off. It's not an ASMR stream. Uh, I don't have, like, fancy equipment to... It's pretty close to the same thickness. Can't really tell. But anyway, this is the Pit of Dread. Does it look like a face? They say if somebody walks in there voluntarily, or if they get forced in there using the Dominate spell, who marches you in there, and you don't quickly move out on your next turn, you get converted to the evil side. So as you can see, this is the original. Here's the remake version. Same number of squares, but the scale is bigger. So, yeah, just keep that flat. And then, of course, you can see the detail. That's a big skeleton. Could be a, an ogre skeleton. So very faithful. If you see naughty images in that, that's on you. Not, not, uh, not the designer's fault. All right, how we doing? Okay, so you pop this one out, this tile out. And you've got these, and I originally thought these were like, because there's swing, swinging blade traps in this expansion. I thought, oh, they put tiles for the swinging blades? That's interesting. But no, these are actually repost. Uh, this, when you get this tile, this says you can attack the enemy right back. So they attack you and you play this like, okay, can I attack you right back? Uh, there's your potion for plus two again. Two more deaths. So there's three of these these uh, death packs that you drop when a hero dies. So I guess when a monster dies, they just don't drop one. Secret doors on the other side and more of these, like, just to obscure the fact that you don't know what it is until you flip it over. Oh, there's, there it is. That's what it, that's what it is. That's what you got. There's also something in there about how when you discover treasure from a treasure chest... In the arena, you're supposed to roll dice, and the dice determine what you got. So I think if you get double sixes, boxcars, you get uh, 300 gold. But I think you roll one, two, or three, you get, like, poison and spears and, like, bad stuff. Okay, this is a floppy piece of cardboard they put in for support. Probably just keep that there to protect it. Here's the quest book. And see, they've, they're protecting their stuff a little bit more. So you got this tissue paper. It's still cold from being outside. Oh, there's Big Ugly. Okay, it's got some tape. Just rip that open. It's the Incredible Hulk. Okay, and it's got a shiny, eh, kind of a matte or satin finish feel to it. Smooth, but yeah, there's the artwork. Quest book, and look how thick this is. This is a thick quest book. 43 pages. Check that out. So, of course, they always have the blank quest book. I'm not going to get into spoilers yet, don't worry. But these are the icons of the bad guys. you got the Ogre Warrior. I was like, what the heck is that? That's what he looks like now. The Ogre Lord. Ogre Champion. Ogre Commander. Who is called the Ogre Chieftain. He's the commander. Skeleton Archer. Goblin Archer, even though none of them actually have bows. And the Orc Archer. So they give you permission to photocopy your scan. Just no surprises there. Okay, so we'll get into this later. Spoilers later. Okay, so we got the tissue paper. We got the cards. Take a quick look at the cards. I think everybody's seen these from those great reporting that was done at Cannes. 
always try to like take it off like neatly and end up just ripping it apart like a kid on Christmas. All right, so there's your cards. Yep, these are very smooth. Even though it's got linen finish, these feel much smoother than the Rise of the Dread Moon or Mage of the Mirror cards, which had more of a more of a matte texture and like you could feel the linen. It was like really raised. So there's the druid spells. You've got a pixie there. You've got a deer. You've got a wolf and a moon behind it. So totally new design, different than the mythic, uh, the mythic ones. So do I have the mythic ones here? Let me just take a quick look here. All right, we may go down the rabbit hole a little bit, but um, these were the original. Mythic tier has lab druid spells. Okay, so they had this design. This is the old one. This is the new one. So this is much more texture, a lot less. So there's the change. And I was going to say, um, I actually printed out the playtest version of it. So once, once we get to those, we'll compare. Okay, so we've got three of these druid spells in the new version. We'll turn them over so we've got shape shift so this is the new version let's compare it to the old version so that's 2021 2024 we'll just go one at a time here so you can compare those All right, and then we'll look at Pixie. Okay. And now we'll look at Life Force. 2024 and 2021. Much more sparse. Okay, yep. All right, and if you're curious, um, we can even look at the playtest versions from the HasLab campaign. So I just made, whipped these up. These are homebrew. So you can compare the 2021 version, how it's changed over the years. Pixie. And then shape shift. And the big question about shape shifts shape shift is do you use the red wolf to represent the druid? Well, the answer is you can if you want to, but you don't have to. Just like you don't have to use the red gargoyle for the demon form of the warlock in uh, Prophecy of Tell or retail version. But anyway, that's these cards. So we got those looked at. Now let's look at the chaos spells or the dread spells. So we've got dominate, 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 four, five. Five of these. Interesting. See, I thought there were only 12. So there's five of these. That's what it looks like. Dominate. Then we've got mind burst. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Well, I'm pleased that they have the right number. It should be five of each of these. And see, notice how they're purple and everything, but they look different than the, the regular Dread spell cards. See, it's different. So you're not going to get these confused. So there's five of those. There's Mind Lock. Two, three, four, and five. To no one's surprise, that's what that one looks like. Okay, so let's compare to the original version. The original version of Against the Ogre Horde used tokens. So tokens, where are the tokens? Here they are, here's the originals. So originally you were supposed to take these and you were supposed to, you know, lay them out, put them on the character card of the good guy that you were influencing with the spell, and then they would just remove them as the spell wore off or as they broke the spell. Similar to how the Sky Orb is supposed to work in Mage of the Mirror, even though there's no 
mine point damage actually in the quest. <laughs> it's for later. Okay, so we'll just sort these out by type, and I will compare what they look like. So you can see for yourself. So before I actually got my own copy of Against the Ogre Horde, I actually printed out, I made these proxies. I didn't have the right shape, so I just printed them out on these. And I just kind of like did what I wanted with it, you know, tweaked it a little bit. But that's that's homebrew. These are the actual originals. So let's let's compare them. So we'll start out with Dominate. So in the original version, you had five of these tokens. So you had a token or you have a card. So we'll compare the two. So this is the new version, this is the old. Turn it over. The Chaos Sorcerer and Defender both roll dice equal to their mind points. New version. The Attacker and the Defender each roll combat dice equal to their mind points. See, why do they make it so generic? It's only the bad guy using this against uh, one of the good guys. But there you go. Old version. If the Sorcerer scores two skulls or more, he may use the Defender's combat piece for the duration of his turn. New version. If the attacker scores at least two skulls, the spell succeeds. The attacker may immediately take the defender's movement and action. At the end of the attacker's turn, the spell ends. So, they get a little more room, a little more explanation. So that's Dominate. So there's five of those. And then we've got... They change the name from Mind Blast to Mind Burst. So we've got the classic version on the left we've got the new version on the right so we'll compare old version the cast sorcerer and defender both roll dice equal to their mind points the player who scores the most skulls inflicts mind point damage equal to the number of skulls he has in excess of his opponent's score new version the attacker and the defender each roll combat dice equal to their mind points whoever rolls the most skulls inflicts mind da mind point damage to their opponent the damage is dealt Damage dealt is determined by how many more skulls the winner rolled than their opponent. Yeah, basically it. One change they made in this new version is that when you run out of mind points, you go into shock. Just like uh, Frozen Horror, Mage of the Mirror, and Rise of the Dread Moon, but different than Return of the Witch Lord, where you would just went unconscious and you were just taken out of the quest. Not dead, but just taken out of the quest. So in the original version, you were just rendered unconscious, taken out of the quest, and since in every quest you get your mind points restored, your body and mind gets restored automatically, you would just come back into the quest. So it's like dying without dying. But in this one you go into shock, meaning you attack with one and attack die. I forget all the rest. You, you roll one d6 for movement only. I think you just defend with two. So it's like you just get reduced into this pitif pitiful state. But, I mean, if you took, like, a Potion of Restoration, which there's no Alchemist shop in this, sorry, um, you would get, you know, that back, and then you'd come out of out of shock. But, again, they've they made some changes. But, yeah, Return of the Witch Lord now is the odd one out. Oh, if you run out of Mind Points in Keller's Keep, you're, you're just dead. So, yeah, you open up the book. Where's the Alchemist shop? It's not there. No Alchemist shop. No spoilers yet. No spoilers. Um... No alchemist shop. Sorry. No alchemist shop. Yeah. I hate to break it to you. But look at all this. Look at all these rules. No spoilers yet. Uh, still no spoilers. No spoilers. Okay. Now we'll just hold off on that. But yeah. There's no alchemist shop. Also the rule, the old version had a rule where the ogres would just take up space. No monsters could pass through them. Um, they just blocked everything until they were dead. In this version, no mention of that anywhere. So, no variable body points either, I checked. Sorry. So, yeah, I know Amalgamash clarified himself. <laughs> he wanted 10, ten uh, body points, but he wanted it for the Mage of the Mirror Ogres. And, and his philosophy is, you know, keep it the same as it was originally. I hear that. I presume that they consulted... 
enough fans along the way that they felt free to make these changes. They didn't just make them just to make them. They figured enough people who would have played it back in the day were okay with these changes. But hey, the great thing about HeroQuest, you don't like that, change it to the way you want to play it. Because, I mean, the Quest books are out there. You can play it exactly the way it was originally intended in 1990 if you want. Okay, so then we've got Mind Lock. Let's compare this one here. And it's not just Amalgamash. There's lots of people. I mean, I was kind of hoping that they would include it and say, well, you could play it this way or the new way. Because <laughs> a lot of people are going to get this and they've never played the original version, so they don't know. So there's Mind Lock. Pretty cool. The guy looks just as pathetic. But you'll notice the design is different. They don't have the chaos symbol on his brow anymore. It's this other thing, whatever it is. But still the chaos sorcerer, the dread sorcerer. So old version, the chaos sorcerer and defender both roll dice equal to their mind points. Uh, the defender will be frozen for one turn for each skull scored by the chaos sorcerer. New version. The attacker and defender each roll combat dice equal to their mind points. For each skull rolled by the attacker, the defender is frozen for one turn. If no skulls are scored against the defender, the spell has no effect. Yeah, it's just a little clarification. So that was mind lock. Okay, so onward. Is that all the cards? No, it, no, it isn't. So we got the druid spells, three of those, just three. We've got 15 of these, and they're just duplicates. So people were saying, well, why didn't they use those? You just give us three cards and then use the rest for treasures and artifacts and things. But they didn't. But the idea is you would have, like, multiple of these cards. So I was thinking, like, you've got one card, so you use it. you got to, like, say one use, two use, three use, four use, five use. Like, is that how you would do it? Or, you know, put a die on top of it, you know, and turn the number over to show... But this is just easier. You've got more of these. But they're big and bulky. Whatever. You could always make these. Glue it to some chipboard pretty easily. Okay. So now you got your standard monster cards. And we flip them over. And what do we see? Skeleton Archer. Against non-adjacent targets, a Skeleton Archer rolls one attack die against adjacent targets. So there were no Skeleton Archers in the original version of against the Ogre Horde. But I would have imagined a Skeleton Archer would just, he'd be two up close and he'd be two at range. But here they're saying one. So I guess he must, must use a, a dagger. There's the dagger. Up close and then fire his bow at a distance. So pretty weak, but they are ranged. So there's only one of those cards. And let's see. We've got Goblin Archer be from the archer family because that looks like a pot of flaming i don't know oil or molotov cocktail a bomb which looks like a fire pot greek fire what is it so female goblin cool design but yeah they show an arrow so same stats as a regular goblin but again we got this caveat that up close they only attack with one so they're really weak up close but at a distance they can fire so the the book also says that anytime zargon sees like a regular monster like a goblin they can substitute a uh, goblin archer quote unquote and every time they see a skeleton they can substitute a ranged skeleton if they want to and with an orc an orc so it's kind of like why even bother putting them in the map it's just a suggestion but sometimes you'll see yeah that symbol where it shows an arrow next to the monster so we got the orc archer Looks like the male orc. Very Lord of the Rings-esque. Except for that bow. It's more like a World of Warcraft or something. Again, familiar pattern. No big surprises. It's like just another sculpt. Because in the original version, they would just give you a, a standard orc and you'd just say, oh yeah, that orc has a crossbow. Or that goblin has a short bow. But you just use your imagination. It doesn't matter what the miniature is holding. That's what it is. So next, we've got the Ogre Lord. People were calling him the Ogre King, but it's the Ogre Lord. And yes, these stats are inflated. So I looked and I compared. Now, a lot of people are familiar with Phoenix's version. So the original version of the Ogre Lord 
identical stats except he had only five body points so they've been doubled and yes for like a final penultimate boss um, pretty decent to have 10 plus he's a he's a big guy he takes up a lot of space and you'll see that in a second so that's the ogre lord got the ogre champion okay so he was the one with the mask it looks more like a gladiator type type dude uh, so with this guy it's kind of interesting because the original version he his movement was the same attack was the same his defense was actually six so his defense has gone down and then his body points were only four so his body points have gone up to six his defense is weakened so there you go that's the compromise I guess they just decided that's how they would tweak him because they're using North American rules so th just keep in mind in this game uh, it would have gone with the European version so the Chaos Warriors the Femirs, the Mummies, all would have had one body point each. The Gargoyles, one body point. So the Ogres were kind of the new ones. But now half the monsters have multiple body points. You know, Abominations are two, Mummies are two, Chaos Warriors are Dread Warriors, and Gargoyles are three. So, but you do get all these extra perks. And you'll see that soon, too. Ogre Commander. So this would have been the Ogre Chieftain, originally. And the Chieftain, let's see. Okay, so originally his defense would have been six, so it's gone down again. His body points were four originally. They've gone up to six. So there you go. So that's the Commander. And then last but not least, we've got the Ogre Warrior. So this is the female version. People were calling this the Shaman. Oh, it's the, the Ogre Shaman. But no, it's an Ogre Warrior. There's two sculpts of this, this same character. And there's their stats right there. So comparing it to the original version, uh, the defense was five. So the defense has gone down once again. But the body points, so they varied. I should have said the... Uh, yeah, I said it wrong. The uh, the Ogre Champion and the Ogre Warrior actually had variable body points. I was thinking of Phoenix's version. See, his versions are so influential that people think of those as the default when they're really not. So both of these monsters, their body points would have been just variable. Just a question mark. Because it depends on the Ogre uh, body point track. You would have this variable track... And it's based on, you know, every time you hit an ogre, it records, you cross off one of the boxes. And when you get to a skull that you're crossing off, you've killed whichever one you're fighting. So actually, when I was hearing uh, Amalgamash explain it on Ash Quest, I was like, did I understand that correctly? Because I always thought you'd jump to the next track. Like you start fighting the second ogre and you jump to the next one. But I, I questioned a couple of people who grew up playing the European version. And that's what they said. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I was reading it wrong fine uh, the only version i ever played was phoenix's version so so yeah either of these monsters could have one body point or up to five but in theory yes you could like start fighting one guy and then go fight another guy and then come back and it's like he's still not dead and then you go back and fight and you kill this other guy and then you go back to fighting him and he's still not dead and you keep going until you get to the very end and then it's like then you just kill him so <laughs> it was kind of weird you couldn't really predict Another way you could just do it is just roll a d6 every time you encounter one of these guys and just assign him that number of body points. And just don't tell the heroes until they've killed him. But fixed body points now, 5 and 6. I think what threw me off is the very first time you fight an ogre warrior, there's 5 uh, spots on the track. So it's 5 body points. So after that you sort of think of him as having 5, but... They might have less than that.
It may be hard to believe at this stage, but the original version of Against the Ogre Horde did not have any cards. There were no new cards in this pack. You had the tokens, you had tiles, you had miniatures, but you did not have cards. Instead, what a lot of people see are these. These are the Ogre cards. Let's see, they're just part of the cover. And you might think, oh, this is like the North American version of Keller's Keepers from the Witch Lord. You're supposed to cut these out with scissors, right? Wrong. You flip it over, it's just a picture. It's not like a card back. But you could just refer to this and look, it just says variable. Variable. But this is actually not quite true because the Chieftain, the Ogre Lord, these two guys are not on the Ogre Body Point track. The Warrior and the Champion are. So these guys always have the same number. Okay, so I was saying earlier, the, uh, the Ogre Lord was always five. And the Chieftain was always uh, four. Okay. But again, I've shown you this before. Other people have shown this. Um, so this is the original 1990 Ogre Horde book. No spoilers here. See, this is how they depicted it. They had the Ogre background. So this has changed. This is totally different. So these are more like Warhammer Fantasy Ogres. So they're about eating and fighting. They're kind of chaotic. It's possible for both the Empire and the Forces of Chaos to hire Ogres as mercenaries as long as they are guaranteed a good time, a brawl, and plenty to eat, usually as a result of the fighting. But their habits make them unpredictable and horribly dangerous. So they tried to kind of humanize them a little bit more in the new version. But this is how the body point track worked in the old version. So if you want to use this in the new version, you're perfectly free to do so. So there's how it works. So yeah, read it carefully, pay attention to the instructions, and you'll see how to actually do it. So there's the example. Okay. You can always freeze frame that if you need extra time. Yeah, they call them person personality monsters. But remember, these these were players that were starting out without these multi-point body point monsters. They didn't have like regular chaos spell cards that any you know boss monster could use in certain circumstances. Keep in mind, traps worked totally differently in this version. You could actually remove a pit trap or a falling block trap after the fact, like even after it had been sprung. Whereas in the remake, which uses the North American rules from 1990, same year this expansion came out, once you get a pit trap is sprung, you're stuck with it. Once a falling block trap has fallen, you're stuck. And there are a few quests where you're, you're trapped inside a room. You're not dead. And so what they say in this book is like, Zargon could just provide a way for the hero to escape if he wants to. You know, it doesn't have to be a big deal. So I'll just kind of silence the music there. Yeah, it's it's like, okay, we know you're trapped in this room, but maybe an animal companion could take over for you. Or maybe you can just figure out a way to get out. Like, I don't know, an easy way would be just, you know, he searches for treasure and, oh, he found a Pastor Rock scroll. Because really, I mean, the elf or the wizard might have Pastor Rock, but they might not. Might have used it up already. So this is the old version, how it explains things. You can freeze frame that if you want. Now, this, this whole rule about playing the quest as a series, this is not in the new version at all. Okay? You might be saying, hey, I came here for the unboxing. Well, I want to show you what's different, what's changed. Just like others have shown me. So, the rest are spoilers. But this is the old version. New version is this. Look how much bigger that is. So, this was only 27 pages. This is like 43 And that's because you've got all these tournament rules in the first part. So let's continue on. So we got the ogres, those are the monsters. Okay. This mercenary can move, open doors, attack and defend, but cannot perform other actions. They cannot use or carry equipment, artifacts, treasure 
or other items unless it is explicitly stated that the items are intended for them. Okay, so this sounds very much like the Animal Companion Snow Dasher from Into the Northlands, that digital quest. You can see a lot of that thinking here. Because, and Carmine reminded us um, publicly that <laughs> back in the day that in Rise of the Dread Moon, it doesn't say those mercenaries can't do all these things. So those mercenaries were much more versatile. Well, let's take a look at the mercenary. Well, look at that. It's an ogre mercenary. So they show the other sculpt, but theoretically it could be any ogre warrior. Eight movement squares, four attack, four defend, four body, one mind. Cost, 150 golds. <laughs> golds. Gold coins. I don't know. I personally think maybe 200 would be a little more um, for this sort of thing, but in this version, you can't hire outside mercenaries. It's not like Frozen Horror, where you can share those mercenaries with Mage of the Mirror or whatever. No. You can hire this mercenary, and if you have less than four heroes, you can have the wolf, the wolf ally. So three heroes, a wolf, and an ogre mercenary is the most you can have, or four heroes and one of these guys. You can only hire one per quest. And I guess it's kind of like the old thing. They don't say this, but what happens if Zargon runs out of monsters? Well, you substitute a monster of similar strength. Okay, so you got that. Then you got this one. The wolf is a faithful animal ally. Before the hero begins a quest with fewer than four hero players, they may recruit an animal ally to accompany them for free. The wolf is bonded to one hero and takes their turn immediately following the turn of their allied hero. They can move, attack, and defend, but cannot perform other actions, use potions, or open doors. So they can't even open doors, so you may not be able to finish a quest if all you've got left is a wolf, just like into the Northlands. Now, the human mercenaries, or the elf mercenaries, they could carry your gear for you. So you get killed, they can scoop up your gear, maybe they can't use it, or maybe they can, and they can carry it to the end of the quest. These guys, they don't have that ability, according to the rules that they created. So this was the cursed card, we called it, because every photo of it was blurry, you couldn't quite see, there was a reflection. Um, so totally different type of artwork. I'll show you what the uh, Snow Dasher one looked like. Okay, so I printed this out. This is from Into the Northlands. That's Snow Dasher. That's what he looked like. And then this is against the Ogre Horde. So you can see the stats are identical. See, movement is 10. Yeah, so there's a little more explanation on, on the new version. So again, this is a fan-made, well, all I did was crop and print off into the Northlands. But originally, you would have used this. This is the mystery tile from the remake game system. Use that to represent, you know, the wolf. Of course, if you have Mage in the Mirror, this wolf tile is pretty good because it's a single square. So, I mean, rather than using the giant wolf figure, which was a two-square monster. So anyway, so this is this is that character there. And then the remaining cards from against the Ogre Horde, you've got You Are the Druid. Make sure this is the right one. A Woodland Guardian Potent Healer. You are a powerful physical combatant. When under the effects of your shapeshift spell, but can be weakened when your resources are depleted, you do not wear metal armor. So... In this Hero Quest uh, remake, we understand metal armor includes helmets and chainmail and plate mail. Uh, the only non-metal armor would be bracers. Cloaks don't count as, as armor, even though they may protect you. And uh, bracers are non-metal armor. Shields are just their own thing. They're a type of armor, but they're just a shield. So you've got the female and the male version of the druid. There's the stats, and we'll just I'll get the music back again here. Yep. So these are the new versions. Now, there originally was no druid in the Against the Ogre Horde box. In the original version, there was no druid hero at all. But let's just... 
Oh, so this is the this is the fan printed uh, version from the HasLab campaign. So you can see the stats are the same. It's basically the same point. There are other versions of this online, like earlier versions. So, but anyway, and I can show you the, the actual original here. All right, here we go. Here is the final version of the Druid. This was the HasLab version. So the playtest version, and then here's the new versions. Yeah, you can tell there's much more texture on these cars. These are much more smooth. So this was the... Twenty twenty one. Okay, anyway, enough of that. I've never actually played as the Druid, but I do think the design has definitely improved. I people will call these halflings or whatever, hobbits, whatever you want to call them, but that's what they are. So that's the cards. Now We've looked at the tiles, so let's look at the miniatures. Finally, and we'll compare them. So there's your two layers. These are the candy trays. Okay, let's see how easy it is to punch these out or pull these out. Easy, very easy. Okay. So there's the ogre warrior, gray. It's clearly gray. Let's compare it to one of the remake figures. That's basically the same color of plastic. It's kind of this, uh, see how bendy is it? Yeah, very bendy. You dip it in boiling water, but yeah, it's kind of a cool design. All right, let's compare it to the Mage of the Mirror Ogres, which I have spray painted blue. So this is Mage of the Mirror. And yeah, so anyway, there you go. So you can compare it to one of the heroes. Let's compare it to the, I don't know. Let's compare it to a, a guardian knight. It's a big guy. Let's compare it to a rogue. So anyway, so you got two of these guys or gals. Yeah, same sculpt. So you got two of these. Then you got two of these. Now these are also considered ogre warriors, but this is the sculpt that it shows as the mercenary. So it looks like they got a bone hockey stick. <sighs> High sticking. Okay, so you got four of those guys. Now we can compare them to the classic, classic era. There's people that consider it against the ogre horde to be a classic. Okay, these are the, wait a minute, why is this guy red? Well, that's because that's the original color and they were semi-posable as well. Hmm? So, bigger, and they had interchangeable parts, was the thing. I don't know, I kinda, I'm kinda thinking maybe I should spray paint these guys. So I've got this paint ready to go satin brick Let's see how it looks it's pretty it's not exactly the same but we get the job done and it's you know a different red color oh there's the uh, this is the HasLab Druid not included in this pack but it's a slightly different red color all right so how do these guys stack up to say my homebrew proxied ogres so these are the proxied ogres I okay these looks much more imposing this is my proxy for the Ogre Warrior, or for the, this is a Reaper Bones, Ogre Guard. So, yeah. But, I mean, they could, they could stand up. They could fight. Okay, so then we've got these Orc Archers. Very shiny. Must be how it came out of the mold. 
Well, that's some kind of cool, kind of boxy. Is that a buckler? Interesting. Okay, this guy looks a little better than he does in the pictures. I didn't really think he looked that interesting. But he looks pretty good. So, yeah, you can compare those to the other orcs if you want to. Female orc archer, and of course they're all these dark green color. I don't have a remake orc close to hand to compare, but I mean like an, compared to an abomination. Haslab, it's about, yeah, it's about the same color, it's just really shiny. Of course if you paint it, that goes away if you want, want it to. But yeah, notice how they're mirror images of each other, the male and female. Similar to how they did it with the uh, Elven archers in Rise of the Dread Moon and Mage of the Mirror, they made them as mirrors, so left-handed, right-handed. And do they have daggers for close-range attack? I suppose they probably do. Somewhere, maybe, or maybe they just punch. I don't know. But anyway, you've got uh, four of those, so two each. Or two of each kind. I can't even remember which, which one goes where. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. So two male, two female, four total. Then we've got these. <laughs> they call these the goblin archers. But these are clearly like goblin bomb throwers and goblin boomerang throwers. So once again, they're green. They're small. They're squat. They're ready to party. They have the same exact stats. And there's two each, four total. All right, and then, of course, the highlight, the big guys. So this is the ogre champion. This big guy, very shiny. So these minis are much shinier than the other HeroQuest remake minis that I've seen before. Okay, so the test is gonna be, all right, so let's say you're fighting these guys and they start taking damage. Well, you're supposed to put the skull tiles underneath the figure, right? Well, it's not very practical to do that with the large bases because they were not two base figures originally. But let's get some skull tiles out here from the original game. I'm surprised they didn't include any extra skull tiles. I thought, you know, they're going to need some with this 10 body point monster. But okay, so we get four of them there. Okay. So let's check the stats again. The champion has six body points. So he could take up to five hits. Yeah, I got some commentary in here as well. That's right. Because everybody's going to do their own unboxing. And I just want to give you my thoughts on it. So this is what five skull tokens looks like. Will five of them work? Uh, shoot, not quite. <laughs> I guess you could tuck them in like that. Could he stand on five of them? Kind of in a wobbly fashion. I mean, you could put two and two. Maybe that body point tracker was a good idea after all. You can kind of like balance him on it. I was hoping there'd be more clearance here. Like if, if that thing wasn't hanging down, you could just put it right underneath. So I guess you're just going to put it next to him. Like, like it's kill team or something. But anyway, yeah, let's compare this guy to the ogre champion from the original version. Let's see, I gotta consult the artwork. Champion. Okay, that guy. He's got an axe in his hand. So this guy. Dark blue. Got my dark blue. I mean, it's not the exact color, but I've already painted these guys kind of a darker blue. So it's almost black in the light. So I'm going to spray paint this guy to make him this color. It's going to be glorious. 
Same with this guy, Chieftain. But anyway, let's compare. So yeah, right away you can see this guy is way bigger. But I mean this guy you could put those skull tiles under him pretty easily. Because this base is slightly bigger than the standard hero quest bases, but not that much bigger. Of course he's posable, he isn't. But I mean the pose kind of reminds you of it. It's like he, he's got the, the buckler or the spiked shield, whatever. It's a big guy. Alright, here's the chieftain. Okay, the chieftain, or the commander, six body points. I think we're going to have the same problem with this one as the other. I mean, I know a lot of people like to put the tile snack. I mean, you fight them in these big areas. Yeah, it's going to be hard. You can kind of tuck them in, I suppose. So you're probably just going to end up putting it next to it or use a, a body point tracker. It's a cool looking, cool looking guy. He's got all this bones and blades, and he's collecting horns of other monsters he's killed or whatever. Beasts he's defeated. He's got a lot of detail on him. So, yeah, all the painters are like, yes, these guys are awesome. You know, they want to want to paint the big, big figures. All right, so this is what the chieftain looks like. It's got a blade arm, spiked blade. So old versus new. See, very easy to get these out of here. So this, you could actually be a nice storage solution. Here's the Ogre Lord. Okay, it took a little bit of effort to pop him out of there. That's the big guy. Again, he's got this uh, thing coming down. So he's got 10 body points. That's five right there. You're not going to put nine. It's not going to work very well at all. So make yourself um, a tracker, print out a tracker, whatever. I mean, I guess you could get a D10 and roll it, you know. Uh, but yeah, he's got the finger poke of doom. So yes, um, Ace Bauer inspired me. There's the Frozen Horror. There's the Ogre Lord. Take away the bases, and they're pretty good size. Pretty close. So it was like... And then he immediately falls down. One, two, three. Like, all right, I guess I won. Finger poke of doom. So, yeah. But he takes up two squares, takes up four squares. So that's the remake Frozen Horror. But, yeah, it's a cool guy. He's got a crown. He's got this fur got this giant scepter or mace or whatever it's a pretty cool looking guy so we give him the royal blue treatment as well see how that goes but yeah they're definitely beige they're not uh, light gray I was concerned that they'd be light gray it's such a boring color okay finally the skeletal archers or the skeleton archers so I, I could not see the face because of the the white that's some good detail on these guys. They're pretty nice, and yeah, nice and bendy. So skeleton archers. People love skeleton archers. People were just begging for skeleton archers, like for the longest time. It's like that and Skaven, or Scaven, rat people. So we've got these, now where's the rat people? So you get three of those. And they should be the same color as the skeletons. Okay, now we got our heroes. We got the two druids and look at them. Look how little they are. Little druids. And they're mirrors of each other. So it doesn't say you can't have more than one druid in a party. So I guess in theory you could. And then there's the Hazlab version. She's like a giantess compared to them. So, this is a HasLab version. This is the new version. So, this comes with it. So, you've got a fifth hero, or maybe even a sixth hero. And then here's the wolf. Oh, look how tiny it is. It looks so mini. It looks like a baby wolf. Or just a normal sized wolf with just a really big hump or mane or whatever. So, this is your animal ally. Ogre. 
it even tells you what it is. Okay, so compare this to the giant wolf. Yeah, no contest. It's like, oh, nom, nom, nom. See, now with this one, this is from Mage of the Mirror, you can stack the tiles easily on top of the surfboard. I was hoping that that's what you would get to do with these ogres, but there's, like, no room. So, if they hadn't had that, that uniform armor or whatever hanging down, you could actually put the tiles underneath a lot easier. So there's the the uh, wolf, the wolf ally. So now the furniture. Okay, that came out a little bit harder. This is the ogre throne. You'll be ogre throne if you anger the people. Oh, I like how there's a crack there. Okay, it's pretty hard. It's pretty shiny. People would love to paint this. So it's great. Can you sit in it? You can stand on it. If you want to rule the ogres, you can stand on the throne. <clears throat> yeah, you can put somebody through it, maybe. Oh, yeah. I forgot to show you my ogre champion. So, here's the homebrew one. This is just a proxy from the... And yes, I made him two squares. From Reaper. I forget if it's Ogre Crusher. Or Ogre Clubber. Smasher. I don't know. They had all these fun names for him, but look it up. Reaper Bones. Yeah, pretty close. Of course, this guy's much more bulky. And then I had an Ogre Mercenary as well. So my homebrew one painted him nice and red. Okay, this guy's way stronger. It's like, uh, bam. I was thinking, okay, you could hire this guy. Again, Reaper Bones. With the base on him. But yeah. So those guys will be red. The big guys will be blue. I mean, you know, beige is fine, but it's just so boring. Okay, yeah, and the original Ogre Throne was this thing. You would take the sides off the the regular plastic throne and just put them on this one so I mean that was scaled to these guys oh yeah we got to do the comparison so this is the this is the classic ogre lord and the new ogre lord yeah much more impressive but the fact is they made them all big not just that one guy And let's see, the, the champion, lord, and the chieftain. All right, let's look at the chieftain again. The chieftain has the mohawk. The mohawk haircut. So these were just head swaps. So like the uh, like how they did the the mercenaries in the other pack. I mean they did all new sculpts. So they're more unique, more interesting, even if they're not posable and they're big. So I'm pretty impressed. Even though I've seen these before, just see them in person. It's like hey, they're a lot shinier. Okay, this is the Portcullis Gate. This did not exist in the original, and th these are used in the arena. Okay, so that slides right out. Yep. So you can just say it's open, closed. You can sneak up behind him and be like, bam! Ugh. You know, something like that. Okay, so you got that. You can put something else in there, I guess. Just slide it back closed. you just be like, ugh! Ah! Yeah. Okay, you got two of these. So, we could do it like part way. It'll stay and slide. I guess you could put some sticky tack in there to like really hold it in place if you wanted. It doesn't just fall out. So, it holds well enough. It's hard. Can you bend it? Ugh. Barely. Okay, so we got those two porkless gates, and these are the stone doors. So that's what that looks like. Very shiny. Does it say speak and enter? 
So this is the, what the original version looked like. You just would slip that into a door base. So this is a solid piece. So yeah, there's four of these. Don't even bother taking them out. And this is like a little gap. I guess you could put dice in there or something. I don't know. You could put tiles. Tiles go in here. You always got to do this. Show there's nothing else in there. It's not the arena. Sorry. But could you play the arena inside the box? I suppose you could. Pull all this stuff out. Look, you could just play it right in there. You could just be like, okay, we're playing. And yes, these guys only take up two squares, not two and a half or three or whatever. See? And the Ogre Lord is not any bigger. See? So, some of those CGI images they had on Hasbro Pulse, or not even Hasbro Pulse, it was um, Avalon Hill posted it on uh, Instagram and X. And, yeah, they showed some of them. It was, like, overlapping the square. It was, like, three, almost three squares wide, but no. Not the case at all. So, that was the unboxing. Um, we're about to go into the spoiler area. So if you don't want to be spoiled, go ahead, take your time, get the expansion, open it up, look at the stuff yourself. Um, we're not in spoilers yet, but we're about to be, okay? So I will give you another warning before this happens. So Ace Bauer already did this, but go ahead and take a look. There's the, ogre, the new ogre background. You can read that at your leisure. Got the contents. So they've added a lot to this, like a lot. So if you were worried that you weren't going to get your 45 bucks worth, you're definitely going to get it here. Because it's like two games in one. Uh, the arena is something totally different. The tournament, it's like a skirmish game. Also, they added these supply crates. I forgot to mention that. It's purple. So they took like an empty room and they'll just throw one of these in there and it's automatically got four potions of healing and each one is a 1d6. Uh, worth of healing so you get lots more healing so even though they don't give you the five super healing potions at the beginning because it doesn't say you can't shop but it also doesn't say that you can so the fact is you have more opportunities to get healing so it's going to be okay even though you've got tons of gold you don't get to spend it on anything but that's the original was like that too could you gamble on the outcome of these fights i mean i guess if you wanted to they did put in unthreatened movement, so if you get two dice normally, you could say uh, eight. You automatically move eight when there's no monsters on the board. If you only roll one die, then you could automatically do four. I still prefer to roll, but actually when we play, I just say you get 12 or you get six. Heroes are just going to run into traps anyway. Large monsters, they get to attack all ten squares around them. So they would always say, well, they can attack diagonally, but they can attack all the squares around them. So that clears it up. Play it your way. See, I love that. I love the fact that they're just putting it there. So for all the people who are like, no, rules is written. Well, rules is written say that you can do more than one thing. So according to this, you can skip the tournament entirely if you want to. Or you can just play the tournament. But yeah, if you want to, skip right to quest four. Start playing. They've changed the names of these quests as well. Uh, almost all the quests have the name slightly changed. Yeah, and they um, they don't give you an open and closed door. But, I mean, you could... The stone doors, you got to force your way through them with a dice roll. But, I mean, you could use this as the door that you go in and out of, I suppose. Just for fun, for laughs. Or you could use, you know, just use a closed door in the remake. Or if you have Return of the Witch Lord, you know, you could use this or Keller's Keep, you know. You could use these if you wanted. But there's no extra doors included. This is this is what you get for furniture. That's it. Okay. So play it your way. 
multi-phase enemies. So this is cool. This is not really a spoiler, but yeah, you could have a monster where, yeah, they meet those conditions and they go to the next phase. So that's a cool thing. That was not in the original. There's 15 pages of this. Bone weapons. Okay. So it's just like a bone sword would be just like a regular sword, except you can't sell it back for gold. It's just made of bone. I would say, well, what if what if the uh, what if the wolf wants to chew on it for extra health or something? <laughs> Ogre mercenaries. So there you go. So this Gruzbella Hammerhand, that's a new character. World End Tournament. See, all this was hinted at, or a lot of this was hinted at in the the Wandering Monk stuff. So ranged enemies. It explains how that works. Okay, so there's the animal allies. So you can freeze frame and read that if you want. Again, this was all posted well before this. you'll see this video. And see, other people are doing the exact same thing, so you can get their commentary. I, I like all this. I enjoy it. I mean, I, was, I would have been fine playing the old way. But, I mean, if you want to try it out this way, I mean, it's they've tweaked it, balanced it for the new rules. Some people were saying, ah, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's fully... Um, you know, if it, if, if it flows as well as they would like. So maybe some people will kind of like do a different remix of it. Okay, it says here, yeah, this was pointed out to me. The dwarf may automatically disarm a swimming, swinging blade trap once it has been discovered. So he doesn't even have to roll. Any other hero with a toolkit may attempt to disarm a swinging blade trap. To do so, they must roll one combat die. So it's super easy for him. If they roll a shield, they successfully disarm the trap. If they roll a skull, the trap is immediately triggered. So nothing changes for the other heroes, but the dwarf has no risk to disarm it. And I would say, I mean, if you were using a human mercenary uh, scout, but I mean, you don't get to use them in this one. You just get to hire the, the ogre mercenary or the wolf, and they can't disarm anything. <laughs> okay, let's just go. There's Yeah, it's 15 pages. Okay. There's the Dread Sorcerer spells. It explains them. So again, it just tells you the same effects. So you, as Zargon, you don't have to flip back and forth. You can, I do recommend you study this ahead of time. So just like Rise of the Dread Moon, you probably should study it ahead of time. It's different than all the other hero quests where you can just flip the page and basically just kind of wing it. With this, you probably want to read up on it a little bit. But I mean, all that is on the cards as well. So you don't have to worry, but I mean, it's there if you need it. Mind burst. <laughs> Your mind has burst. Okay, and there's a sample roll. Yeah, so the bad guy can take damage. Six mind points, yep. Because if you brought the Talisman of Lore with you, you could have an extra one. So this is totally new, this World's End Tournament. First three quests, so that's not really a spoiler. I think everybody kind of knew that, but they are the ones at the beginning. Challenger, Defender. There are two teams in a tournament, the Challenger team and the Defender team. The heroes and allies make up the Challenger team, while Zargon's forces lead the Defender team. All right, and it says use the activation token to mark miniatures that have been activated. Place the Defender team here. Here's how the tournament works. At the start of the battle, the doors to the tournament hall raise to reveal both teams. Rounds track the, the activation cycle of teams. At the start of each round, the defender team goes first. So the monsters get to go first. Which is different. Usually the heroes go first. Zargon chooses one member of the defending defender team to activate and then takes that monster's turn using their movement and action. Play then passes to the challenger team who activate any one hero and take that hero's turn. Continue alternating turns between the defender and challenger teams. Each turn, the respective team activates one team member who has not yet been activated. So this makes me think of, I mean, I haven't played like Kill Team or Fire Team really, but, well, no, I played a little bit of it. Nah, I, I take it back. I played a little bit of Kill Team at Gen Con. I mean, the GM guy like explained everything, so I leaned on him a lot, but it makes me think of some of these other games. These other skirmish games, which are really popular, so why not? So they keep on doing that. Okay. 
So you end the round. After all members of both teams have been activated, the round ends. All defenders and challengers deactivate, but remain in the same square where they were when the round ended. A new round begins with the defender team going first. Rounds of activation continue until one team is defeated. The battle ends. The team left standing wins. Solo combatants. So when you're left to one member, they're emboldened by the cheers of the tournament spectators and gain a surge of energy. In addition to their own turn, they may take a basic maneuver after each opponent's turn. A basic maneuver consists of either moving up to their movement speed or rolling two attack dice against an adjacent creature. If they can usually attack diagonally, they may do so in the basic maneuver as well. So that's interesting. A solo combatant may not take a basic maneuver if they are incapacitated or would not be able to take their action, for example, under a Tempest spell. This rule applies to combatants whose teammates have all been defeated. A combatant who becomes a solo combatant maintains its activation token. Treasure. A hero uses an action to search for treasure while adjacent or... See, people who wanted this, your wish has been granted. People, for a long time, I wasn't one of them, I didn't care, but people for a long time have wanted to be adjacent to a treasure chest to search it. Well, here you go. In the tournament, that's how it works. So it doesn't say that, you know, you can't do it if monsters are present, because there's always going to be somebody in there. You can just go ahead and search. So to search, you roll two red dice to determine the result, then remove the treasure chest from the board. So if you get a two, it's an explosive trap. You lose three body points. Three to four, poison gas, you lose two. Five to six, arrow trap, lose one. So this sound doesn't sound very good. But if you get a seven, you get a bone battle axe. Eight to nine, you get 100 gold coins. 10 to 11, you get 200. 12, you get 300. But see, now why do they talk about bone weapons not being able to be sold if you can't visit shops? I don't recall them saying anything about shopping here. So maybe you can shop between quests. I mean, you have tons of gold. You could buy whatever you wanted. But there's no alchemist shop, so they seem to leave it wide open. I mean, the original version, you would have just had tons of gold at the end and to spend it on whatever you want for the next expansion. So death in the tournament. If you're out of the game for the remainder of the quest. It's pretty standard. Items in this possession. In their possession prior to death remain on the square where they died. They can be picked up by any hero who moves adjacent to the square. No action required. Okay, so the monsters can't claim your gear. Incomplete. Can't be completed, ends in disastrous results, such as the death of all heroes. Zargon should modify the quest before it is replayed. You can do this by creating a new battle using the World's End Tournament on page 12. So, once again, a second type of uh, blank quest map in here. Trophy tiles. The little helpful skeleton guy. If they end their turn on a trophy tile, they may collect the tile. No action required. Okay, so this does say you have to be on it. The tile is added to a shared team pool. You got to end your turn on it, and maybe use or your movement. That says to end your turn. Okay, so at the end of your turn, you just move and land on it. It may use may be used by any member of that team. Tiles may not be stolen. They remain throughout the rounds of a battle, but any uncollected tiles disappear at the end of the battle. Once used or activated, the tiles are discarded. Okay, so it's as a lot of people were expecting. Oh, uncollected tiles disappear. It doesn't say the other ones, like you could just hang on to them, I guess, till next time. Burst of speed, and any time a combatant may discard any trophy tile to add two squares to the movement. That's cool. Combat tiles. So again, I'm covering this because these are new rules. Combatant may use a combat trophy tile to add to their combat roll. Use it after rolling combat dice. So this means you add two skulls. For example, a, con a combatant could discard a white shield tile to add one shield to their defend roll. So it's like you're using, you're activating it. Add it. Or a white sh uh, skull tile to add one skull to your attack roll. Healing potion tiles. A combatant may discard a healing potion tile, trophy tile, to restore lost body points equal to the number on the tile. Combatants. Body points are reduced to zero. They may discard a healing potion tile before they die immediately to restore to restore, restore body points. Can't even talk. 
Okay, and here's the riposte tile. So this is what I thought was the swinging blade. A combatant who suffers damage from another combatant adjacent, or immediately diagonal to them, may discard a riposte trophy tile to immediately attack back. So it may be used even if the defending combatant is defeated by the triggering attack. So you get one more hit on him, just as you're going down. If the combatant would not be able to take an attack otherwise, such as under the effects of the Tempest spell, they may not take a riposte attack until the effects have ended. If a large monster ends their turn on multiple trophy tile, they collect whatever amount they end their turn on. Okay, so there's an advantage to having those double wide monsters. Didn't think of that, did I? Okay, this is not a spoiler yet. Playing the tournament outside of quests. Okay, so this is like your generic battle. Tournament battles can be played separately from quests whenever heroes wish to test their metal against the might of Zargon. So they can keep fighting, getting more gold, but they can't use it? That seems weird. How to play. Determine the challenger team power. Each hero begins with a power of one. Then adds the attack dice of their strongest attack. Add up each participant's hero, hero's individual power to get the team's total power score. So broadsword four, short sword three. Oh, they begin with a power one. I get it. So you add. So three plus one is four. And the genie would be five. So we add one to, and make six. Team power of 16. So this is the arena tile and the two extra rooms. Assemble the defender team. Their power must be less than or equal to the challenger team's power. See the World's End team roster on page 16. So it makes it fair. Ah, so you could build a party of even more heroes. Hey, you could get all the red figures that you've collected over the years and get a bunch of monsters on the other side. Okay. Shuffle the trophy tiles. Shuffle. Yeah, right. Mix them up. Maybe put them in a bag or something. Uh, and place them face down on the squares designated on the map. On the corners there. Place any remaining trophy tiles to the side. Defender team is placed on the tile first. Sargon used the Game Master screen to conceal the defender team from the heroes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Finally get a use for the GM screen. You have to cover it up. Once the defender team has been placed, the challenger team is placed. After both teams have placed their tile and team members, remove the game master screen from the board and reveal the defender team. The defender team opens the door and begins the first round. Play proceeds as in playing a tournament battle. So the defenders are the bad guys. Yeah, I'm just thinking if we play this on the stream, how we're gonna do it. Okay. Monster versus monster variant. Instead of playing with heroes, both the teams could be monsters. Both sides agree on an equal team power for both sides. Randomly determine which team will be the challenger team and which team the defender. Defender team selects a monster from those available first. The two teams proceed to select to alternate selecting monsters until each team meets the agreed upon team power. As with all tournament battles, the defender team starts the first round. Optional rule, player safeguards. The halls of the Ogre Lord are filled with peril, uncertainty, and of course, punishing traps. Many heroes of old have found themselves trapped in a room with no exit to be found. Notice the spelling of old. For heroes wishing to travel in the footsteps of these classic heroes, run the quest as presented. Otherwise, consider allowing heroes who become trapped to find an escape. For example, a trapped hero searching a pit trap might reveal a tunnel back to their companions. Alternate, alternatively, a faithful animal ally might step in to replace a trapped hero. Example of World's End Tournament Roster. So we got the map symbol of a goblin. You got all these stats there. Number three. Oh, because he attacks with two and you add one. Three. Six total. Oh, no, it's three goblins. Two, four, six. Oh, well, it's not the power. I'm not sure I understand this. I'll have to like look at it again. Give them a team. Because if you add one to it, their attack is two, so it's three each. 
And if there's three and three, it'd be nine. But why did they say six? I'm not sure. Goblin ranged two and gives you four. Yeah, it shows all the monsters. Anyway, I don't want to take up the whole stream trying to think about how I would play the rules. But there's your blank, so you can just copy this. They give you permission to scan it. There's all your... So they're saying you can only use these monsters. Game system and against the Ogre Horde. They don't... But I mean, you could always just say, yeah, I'm going to throw the Frozen Horror in here. I'm going to play it like I saw it at Gen Con. Okay. Message for Mentor. All right. We've come through the non-spoiler section. Hour and a half. Next is going to be the spoiler section. Hear that? Spoilers. Okay. From here on, spoilers. So if you don't want spoilers, just pause the video, stop the video. Um... I'm really impressed with this pack. I'm glad I got it. I look forward to playing it. But from here on are going to be spoilers. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay, I warned you. All right, message from Mentor. Hearty welcome to you, heroes. I've come before you all to call upon you, or to call once more upon your bravery and heroism. For you see there is yet an, an unrest within the bounds of the realm. The runes twist and take shape on the pages of Lortome, warning of strange happenings in the land of the ogres. Happenings at the center of which I fear a familiar dreadful presence lies. Zargon's latest plot targets the Deergrushed Horde, a powerful and secretive community of ogres far to the north. He seeks to corrupt the lord of the Deergrushed clan and use their fighting prowess towards his own desires. Though little is known of these private people, it should come as no surprise that ogres are mightily powerful. If Zargon wrests control of them, they will be a formidable weapon to further expand his dominion of dread. Alas, I cannot divine the location of the Deergrushed Fortress. But Lord Tome reveals the identity of a potential ally, who may have information for you to access the fort. This person will not be easy to meet. They are the reigning master of battle at the notorious World's End Tournament where only the bravest of warriors compete for glory, at risk of their lives. If you manage to catch their attention, they may hear you out. Heroes, the way forward is clear. Prove your merit in the World's End Tournament, infiltrate the Deergrushed Ogre's Hold, and sever Zargon's newfound alliances. If you fail, I fear the consequences shall be most dire. So totally new uh, entry, and some people guessed what it was going to be like. See, there's the supply crate, the purple. Okay, more spoilers coming up. And I'm just going to go kind of quickly through these. Um, honestly, comparing it to the original, very little has changed in the non-tournament sections. There's a couple places where they have changed very small things. But for the most part, the only thing that's changed are the notes. So I'm just going to go ahead and get set up here. Okay, so this is the first quest. So obviously this is no corollary in the original version. So you got your tournaments. Wave 1, 2, and 3. These are for Zargon's eyes only. And yes, if you want to see this, you're going to have to look at it. Look at the screen. Spoilers. Again, another tournament, Quest 2. And I want to shout out, of course, Dead Gamer. He did the same thing for me during the HasLab campaign. Let me know what I was getting myself into. Quest 3. So we got a multi-stage battle there. Okay, now, now we get into the comparison. Spoilers. Yeah, so you can, 
you can uh, you can see it's it's pretty similar. Now you may say, oh well, that that's where the the falling block traps work totally differently in this version in the North American rules. But you're looking at it, things look the same except there's a treasure chest there, whereas here there wasn't a treasure chest. And then the note, you actually do get a crossbow. So in this version, you don't find any equipment. You find one 1d6 potion of healing, and the rest are just gold and jewels. And there's the, the body point trackers. Whereas here, you actually find a crossbow. Uh, later, you find um, some chain mail. They call it red, blood red chain mail. And I think you find a battle axe. Or no, that's the bone battle axe I'm thinking of. Okay, so it's beyond the gate or the outer caves. So there's the original version. And there's the remake version. I know it's not HD quality necessarily, but beyond the gate. So they changed the story a little bit, but not by much. So there's your body point, ogre body point tracker. You don't need it here. So they did add, let's see. No, I guess they really didn't add anything. Two Chaos Warriors. Okay, they did change this. It's only one Chaos Warrior instead of two for the Wandering Monster. So they made that part a little bit easier. Now, each room in the North American rules could be searched by each hero. So up to four times. Whereas in the European rules, each room can only be searched for treasure one time. So if there's a note, that's all you get. So there's more opportunity for wandering monsters, but it's just going to be one cast warrior instead of two. So there's a difference right there. Four goblins for the first one, of course. Lair of the Ogre Lord. So not of the Lair of the Ogre Horde, not of the Orc Warlord. Okay, so very, very similar. Of course, you've got the colors in the North American version in the remake edition. Very, very similar. Let's see here. Yeah, they did not uh, increase the strength of these uh, Chaos Sorcerers at all. They've got one body point. In Phoenix's version, they have three body points. You can always tweak to your liking, but that was a fan-made version, of course. These colors remind me of a Spirit Queen's Torment or Prophecy of Telor. Okay. The carrion halls, so they're eating carrion, they're scavengers. Whereas here, that's called the tumultuous halls, because they are gentle creatures, <laughs> maybe. So very similar. Let's see if we see any differences here. I mean, super veterans of the game will, will know. Diamonds. Okay, so blood red chain mail right here. That was not in the original. Short bows. Yeah, in the original they say short bows. Okay. Two abominations instead of two Famir, but same deal. Pit of dread versus the pit of chaos. Now you can see there are some rule differences in this one. They give you more of a chance to survive the Pit of Dread, where they don't really tell you much about the Pit of Chaos other than, yeah, you can be converted to evil by it. Anyone who moves into the pit will instantly turn to Chaos and fall under the control of the evil wizard player forever. Okay, so that's what it says in the original. 
Now, the Wandering Monsters three Chaos Warriors. Here it's only two Dread Warriors, so they nerfed it slightly. Festral has three body points in both versions. Phoenix gave him six. That was his attempt to make it harder. So in the new version, it says, in the center of the room is the Pit of Dread. Any hero who willingly moves into the pit or moves into the pit under the dom Dominate spell and does not move out on their next turn after the spell ends is instantly consumed by Dread and falls under the control of Zargon forever. This is the domain of Festral, the Dread Sorcerer. So I suppose you could try to like box the heroes in and prevent them from escaping to make sure that they transform. And of course, what does Festral have? He's got three uses of each of the three spells. And then of course his Dread Warriors have five attack and five defend. Same thing here. So yeah, if the heroes are having a great time, you could always uh, boost those stats slightly. Then we got the Fortress of the Ogre Lord. Fortress of the Ogre Lord. I guess they didn't change as many of the titles as they as I thought they did. So there's the original version. And yes, you can find these online too. Kill the Ogre Lord. Okay. At last, you've reached the heart of the Ogre Fortress. This is the original. Where the Lord of the Ogres presides over his clan. If you can kill the Ogre Lord, you will break the unity of the Ogre Horde and save the Empire from their threat. New version. At last, you have reached the heart of the fortress where Ekur, the Lord of the Durgrushed Ogres, presides over his domain. Ekur has become completely corrupted by the lure of Zargon. There is yet hope for the ogre people under his reign. If you can defeat Ekur, you'll break the unity of the Horde and save the realm from Zargon's threat. So, I guess you can't negotiate with this guy. You're going to have to take him down. Terminate his command with extreme prejudice. That's how it goes. In the hard knock world of hero quests. So he's got five body points. That's the ogre lord. And yeah, we know, as we know in this version, he's got 10. And Zenloth, the sorcerer, has only one body point. So this is new, a bejeweled cat figurine worth 200 gold coins. Not a, not a unicorn kitty, but a bejeweled one anyway. So that's cool. Yeah, they just, they combined the, the gold value instead of saying, oh, it's 700 each. They all conceal traps. It's like, oh yeah. In the original, they have spear traps. In this one, that's poison gas. If they search for treasure before the trap is disarmed, they lose two body points. So there's three treasure chests. All the chests can, any one of them is attacked by one die spear trap. Okay, so the original version, if you search for treasure before disarming these traps, you would have to roll a die, roll a die, roll a die. So you might not get hit by anything, but you could take up to three damage. In this one, there's two treasure chests. One of them has poison on it. And it just you lose two body points immediately so no rolling and i guess if you had the poison antidote you could cure yourself but yeah so that's a change wandering monster is an ogre warrior so that's the same but of course there's more opportunities to get wandering monsters so you could fight more ogre warriors flight to the surface flight to the surface okay so here's the original version from 1990 Got those pits of darkness. These are not fallen block traps. Those are just stone. That's how it was represented in the European rules. Notice how it fits on the board like that. Let's see. Does it fit on the board in the in the first one? Let's see. Yeah, it fits on the board. It doesn't hang off the side. I mean, I could 
take my board out and put it on there. But I mean, it it fits within the border. It doesn't it doesn't hang off of the of the corridor actually. I think that would only happen if you were using like the classic board, but then the remake thing. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, if it's not drawn to scale, so flight to the surface. So there's the original version. If a wander monster card is drawn, any of one, the evil wizard may activate one room. So here's the remake version. And what has changed here? Well, actually, I forgot to tell you on the last one. So this has changed. So in quest nine or quest six, in this center room, the number of monsters has changed. So in the original version, you had, let's see, warrior, champion, warrior, lord, chieftain. So five ogres there, and then you had two warriors outside the door. In the remake version, okay, one of the guards has been taken out. So there's warrior, warrior. There's no, there's a, there was a warrior in the room, and there was a warrior out here. And you've got the chieftain, uh, lord, or com commander, lord, champion. But consider the body points of these guys. So 10 body points, um, 6 body points, 6 body points, and 5 body points, plus 5 body points. So that's more than you would have faced here. So fewer guys, but, but stronger. And they also took away that um, weapons rack that was there. It's gone. But the treasure that you get from that room is exactly the same. So nothing has changed. So that treasure that was just for decoration. But since the guys are whoops, since the guys are bigger, it kind of makes sense they took it out, so there's more room for them to maneuver around in that room. So that's a change. So if we get go back again to the last quest. What has changed here? Again, I may have missed some little subtle thing, but here's one of these rooms where you can just get trapped. You go in there and then the stone block falls there. So you're trapped in that room. There's a treasure chest, but it's empty. They even say it. But I mean, if I was Zargon and being forgiving, I'd say, oh yeah, you find in there, pass through rock scroll. You can get out. Or maybe there's a trap door that leads somewhere else. I don't know. A tunnel that leads to the bottom of that pit and then you climb out. I mean, you could you could do whatever you want. Or you could just say, yeah, he's trapped in there forever and uh, you get to be the wolf now. Well, that's kind of kind of sucks because <laughs> he can't open doors. But yeah, you figure it out. So again, that's that's Avalon Hill leaving the gap for the players to fill in the, in the gap. OK. And what? OK, so let's let's read the original version. A thousand praises, my heroes. You have destroyed the Ogre Lord and shattered the might of the Ogre Horde. But beware, for we cannot rejoice yet. You are still deep within the Ogre Fortress, and the alarm has now been raised. You must escape. If you can reach the surface, you will be able to lead the Emperor's forces against the remnants of the Ogre Horde. And here's where people got out their Battlemaster sets and tried to recreate you know, that scene. But yeah, you turn the page, and there's nothing. There's no epilogue. It's just over. So it's like, okay. I mean, Wizards of Morkar has a little prologue, but there's no like official like ending text. You just make it up. Okay, so then you read the remake version. A thousand praises, my heroes. You have destroyed the formidable Ekur and shattered the might of the Horde, keeping its might from the clutches of Zargon. But do not rest, for we cannot rejoice yet. You are still deep within the fortress, and the alarm has been raised. You must escape and reach the surface. So nothing about leading the army. But check this out. There's an epilogue. Ready for the last spoiler? This was not in the original. Okay, conclusion. 
After your thrilling escape from the fortress, the king's auxiliary forces meet with met with you and Grisbella to defeat the last of Ekor's most staunch followers. I'm not going to read the rest. You can just see it there if you want to look. So yes, the same thing basically happens, but they put it here. They make it clear, hey, it's it's the leader and his followers. It's not all not all ogres. And then here, this is not really a spoiler. This is just the stats that we already knew. So yeah, you could easily adapt, you know, Phoenix's stuff. You could easily adapt the original version. You could play the original version. You could just use this book and the same assets. The cards would be off. And then it just tells you to design your own adventures. So there we go. That's against the Ogre Horde. I hope you enjoyed the unboxing. Uh, that was pretty much it. We went over the miniatures, cards, tiles. I can't wait to play it. But... Um, yeah, it's going to be a little while because we're still playing Mage of the Mirror and we're still playing um, Rise of the Dread Moon. But once we get those done, you can always join us on twitch.tv slash HeroQuest fans on a Friday, 2 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time on Twitch or on Saturday, same place. Uh, lately, we've been doing 7 to 9 p.m. 7 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, back in the day, we were doing 6 to 10, but 7 to 9 works a little bit better. Um, but as time goes on, we'll update the schedule. But yeah, you can play. Uh, it should be good. So I have all kinds of ideas of stuff to add, and I'm sure people have played it before will have stuff too. But yeah, I'll have to be painting some ogres. But um, yeah, instead of um, a traditional rant cast uh, tomorrow, we're probably just going to do another hero quest talk we got a couple people that might be interested so we'll we'll do what we can of course we wish strange bus well we'll have to catch up with him when we can but yeah family stuff that he's got going on anyway so kudos to the uh, avalon hill team especially to encarmine and avalon bill who of course are no longer with the company um yeah, it looks, looks pretty good. Looks like you guys did some great work there with Doug and uh, the rest of the team. So hope it continues. So that's it. Thanks. Thanks for watching. End spoilers.